time for Q&A. I know we already have some questions up. We can put some other questions up. I guess we can put that uh, QR code up. And I've got more Snickers up front if anybody wants them. <laughs> Microphone, we switched. All right. Uh, and you are voting on them, so when you vote on them, they go to the top. The more you vote, the higher up they go. You can still send in questions as well if you want to do that right now. I think you can see, can everyone see the questions as well? Correct? Yeah, you can all see all the questions, so you can vote. And I'll start at the top, but I'm going to try and group them if that's okay. I'll that's cool. I'll group them together uh, a little bit. I'll take STDs for a thousand, Alex. <laughs> well, there's a few of those. Uh, and you've already answered a couple. Um, so you, one of the simple questions was, can an STD affect my baby? Sure. In fact, that's something that's real common. And the most common one is herpes. Not only with the herpes infection being so prevalent and so prominent, um, it can affect your baby. It can r mean that you can't have a vaginal delivery and push the baby out and would have to have a surgery, have to have a C-section. But we still see babies that um, will get herpes. It can infect their brain, but other infections. You know, even though we screen in the state of Florida, we have to screen twice now for all STDs. If we happen to miss one and mom delivers her baby and say she has already been exposed to chlamydia, it can actually get in the baby's eye, even though we put medicine in the baby's eye, babies can still get an infection in the eye and babies can go blind because of this infection in the eyes. Okay, the questions are all moving now, so I'm trying to group them. Ah. Uh, but two that kind of go together, are contraceptives okay? And it just moved. Uh, birth control. Okay, let's talk uh, about birth control. Can, can they cause abortions or what effect can they have on the body? Well, first, contraception, it prevents somebody from conceiving. So. When to use contraception? Use contraception when you're in a marriage relationship is the first thing. It depends on the type of contraception. You know, and I do a lot, spend a lot of time, especially with my couples who come in, a lot of times they'll come in, all the ladies will come in even before they get married and say, hey, it's not the right timing for us right now. I'm still at school at Pensacola Christian College, and so is my husband, and so my husband-to-be, but we're not quite ready to have a baby. Well, what are the different options? There are options that prevent conception from happening. Condoms prevents egg and sperm getting together. Timing. You know, there are little tests that you can get from the, uh, the dollar store now that tell you when you're going to be fertile. Well, used to be that people would use those tests to find out we should be together at this time because my test just turned positive. I have couples who will use those tests in the other way to say, you know what, I'm going to do this little urine test and it says that I'm, you know, I'm ovulating now, I'm fertile now, and they'll use that not to have a sexual relationship. There are some forms of contraception like most of the IUDs. An IUD goes inside of the uterus. Does it prevent egg and sperm from getting together? No. Egg and sperm still get together, and it's got like a three-day trip to go through the tube to come down to the uterus. But guess what? Once it gets down to the uterus, the IUD, intrauterine device, makes it so it can't implant. So con you know, conception already happened, so it depends on the type of birth control. Some actually will be what's called an abortifacient, where pregnancy happened in the tube, and then when it lands down in the uterus, it can implant, and it dies. That's not preventing con you know, conception, that's just making so it can't live and grow. So you need to talk with your doctor, go through the different options, because there are good ways to not get pregnant, and there are bad ways to not be pregnant. Okay. Um, can you explain quickly <clears throat> the use of the reverse abortion pill? Sure. All right. We'll, we'll go into this more tomorrow, but let's talk about two basic things. that You guys have heard all of this. You've heard about the morning after pill. Well, guess how long the morning after pill is indicated for? the morning after. All right, it's indicated for 72 hours after somebody's had intercourse. Then there's the abortion pill, very, very different. The abortion pill isn't the morning after pill. The abortion pill is 70 mornings after pill. It is 98% effective in killing the baby up to 10 weeks gestation, all right? 70 days. How does it work? When a woman gets pregnant, there's a hormone that, anybody play football, wrestling, anything. All right, do you, have a, do you have a coach? You pretty much do what the coach says? What happens if you don't do what the coach says? You, yeah. So the, there's a coach when it comes to pregnancy, and that coach is called a hormone called progesterone. You get big words, you know, nursing, you get big words. What do you do? You break a big word down. Progesterone, progestational steroid hormone. 
progesterone, a woman becomes pregnant. He's the coach. He's like, all right, we got a new full-time job. The full-time job is we're going to send more blood down to the uterus. We're going to relax the uterus so it gets real big. We're going to close the cervix and more nutrition is going to go to the uterus. That's what the hormone progesterone does. The abortion pill blocks that hormone called progesterone. And it will withdraw all the support that is keeping that baby alive. And 98% of the time, it will kill that baby. If we know, and mom, do we, did anybody here ever say something that they regret? Yeah, people take the abortion pill and they have immediate regrets. We have a network called abortionpillreversal.com where we have 500 doctors that will meet the needs because we have an antidote. We have a problem with narcotics, but I know you guys don't have any problems with narcotics up here, right? None whatsoever. Like Indianapolis, there's no narcotic problem there at all. Nobody takes any narcotics. Yeah. So when somebody, overdose, when somebody overdoses on a narcotic, they don't all die. Why? Because we have an antidote called Narcan. Well, we have an antidote for the abortion pill as well, where within, if somebody calls us within 72 hours of taking the abortion pill, 70% of the time we can successfully reverse that. I, I was just showing a picture of a baby I delivered three days ago now that had called me when she was nine weeks pregnant, had taken the abortion pill, 99, 98% chance that that baby was going to die, and she had immediate regrets. She called us. We were on the road, and we were able to call in the antidote. She took the medication. 98% chance she wasn't going to have a, a heartbeat on her baby when she came to my office that next week. We saw her that next week. We had a heartbeat. We saw her a week after that, we had a heartbeat, and I just delivered that beautiful baby just a few days ago. So yes, the abortion pill has gone from, prior to COVID, 39% of all the abortions in the United States were with the abortion pill. Now it's 54%, and there are some countries over in the European Union where 85% of all the abortions are with the abortion pill. It is evil. You guys have done great as far as your legislature passing laws, but it's very difficult to keep the abortion pill from coming in from outside. But we can go through that more tomorrow. But yes, it is growing. Yes, it is evil. But yes, we can reverse it. Okay. I've got about four that go to you. Go. How did abortion become a thing? Sure. Um, uh, when we stop having respect and deviating from biblical principles, when we don't realize that a baby is a gift. You know, this has been going on for a long time. There were herbal remedies and things like that to try to, you know, cause an abortion. Part of the Hippocratic Oath was, you know, well, that was the oath that all doctors would take was that I would not pr provide, you know, abortions. Somebody will ask, because who does abortions? It's somebody like me, an obstetrician who has been trained in how to have healthy moms and healthy babies. And there's a real progression as far as, you know, why somebody becomes an abortionist. First, they'll do it for greed. They can make a lot of money in a short amount of time by aborting babies. But then the next step is that it's pride. Because you'll go to the big national meetings and you'll see the well-known abortionists who are killing babies at the end of the pregnancy. And are they shunned by my peers and the other doctors? No. People are waiting in line to shake their hands, do selfies, and thank them for the, the service they're providing. And it makes them proud. It's like, everybody loves me. So it starts off with greed. It goes to pride. The next, what was Satan's big downfall? How did he get a third of the, of the angels to follow him? Satan wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be like God. When you are a late-term abortionist, and there's a lot of information on the DVD that we gave to your library, you have a baby, you have a leg out, you have the other leg here, you have an arm out, you have the other arm here, the baby's chest and the baby's abdomen are all on the outside. And then you have a choice as that physician. You can reach over and get one instrument, and you can place it up into the brain, and you can take the life of that baby and kill that baby right there. That is almost being like God. I can either give you your life or I can take your life. We need to appreciate that having a baby and being pregnant is an absolute gift. They're the biggest gifts that I've been given in my life are my daughters. And we've gone away from that. They're not a problem. They are a blessing. And we need to use the tools of modern obstetrics to show with ultrasound and other ways that this is not a blob of tissue. You've just been given the biggest gift of your life. And we need to understand that. Um, quick, Everybody, any, you ever seen somebody burn the American flag? You know, you see it on the internet, you see it on YouTube, and somebody's burned the American flag. What good does that do? You know, why would somebody burn the American flag? Well, what does the American flag stand for? What, is it, what image does it represent? 
it represents the image of the United States. If you hate the United States, you can't just destroy the United States. So what do you do? You want to destroy the image of the United States, so you burn the flag. When somebody performs an abortion, what are they doing? They hate God. So what do they want to do? They want to destroy what God said, let us make man in our image. So abortion is really just destroying the image of God. This is not a medical choice. This is a spiritual battle. This is a battle where organized people hate God and are trying to destroy the image of God. That is abortion in its shortest nutshell. It's an attack against the image of God, just like burning and destroying the flag is an attack against the image of the United States. Can you explain a little bit more about the abortion process? You, you mentioned a little bit just now. Surgical or the... Yeah, I mean, let's talk about... the. It used to be that almost all the abortions were done surgically, and that's what really, you know, caught my heart when I went to my office in 1999. I just finished 12 years of training, and it's 1999, and I just took over a practice that I knew was an abortion, you know, place. And it was going up those stairs to the surgical suite upstairs, and what I saw was I saw when I turned the corner, there was the abortion machine, there were all the instruments laid out, and there's several different ways that a surgical, this was before the abortion pill even, where the first trimester abortion, you know, the way it works is that the baby is up there on the inside, and there's a real strong suction that's placed. There's a, um, in the bottom of my computer bag, at the very, very bottom is a little clear plastic tube. Never mind that the bag is, just bring, it on, bring me the whole bag, and I can probably find it faster. Uh, we're going to deviate a little bit, but we got y'all here, so we were here to train and to educate. We're going to make it real fast. So let me just bring this out. All right. You saw my daughter, Sydney, there on the inside, remember, jumping and sliding, and she was in that big bag of muscle. You got to see my wife's inside. She got to see her womb, all right? She's sitting right over there. So when you have that baby that's there on the inside, and just imagine there's just a, like something about the size of an avocado that's there on the inside. And then there's the cervix, and this is what keeps the baby on the inside. But then when they're going to do an abortion, Sydney's up here, she's jumping and sliding and moving around on the inside. This little plastic tube, this is hooked up to another tube that goes down to a, a machine. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that machine. But that's the suction machine. And if you look underneath, it has a motor in it that's the same horsepower as your garbage disposal underneath your sink at your house. And it causes severe... In fact, if I were to take this you know, same tube, and we do this in one of the videos, if I were to take this tube and put it into a steel paint thinner can or a turpentine can, you know, one of those metal steel square cans you can stand up on, and just turn it on, that steel can, which I can stand on, would just go crunch. It would just crush itself. That's the kind of force. So you have the baby that's there up on the inside, and this tube is placed up there right where the baby is, and that same suction power that is going to the abortion machine that can crush a steel can essentially will just suck that baby out. And when you have that much force, it doesn't look like a baby anymore. But that's the first trimester. Second trimester, when it comes to an abortion, the baby's too big. You know, like when you saw the surgery, remember the baby that was having that laser vascular surgery and then the baby that was there on the inside and there was no fluid around the baby? Well, that baby's too big to suck through a little tube like that. So they would use an ultrasound. They would take an instrument called a, a sofa forcep, which has teeth in it, like shark's teeth. And, you know, shark's teeth, do they face this way or they face backwards? Why? They face backwards so that when they bite a fish, the fish can't get away. These have teeth in them as well. And when you put this forcep up through the cervix, up in where the baby is, what they do is they'll grab an arm, they'll grab a leg, whatever, and they'll just take that out. That's the second trimester abortion. And we have videos for all of these. And what do we do? You can go to our, uh, you can go to Pro-Life, you know, our uh, YouTube channel. And they're right there. Go to our YouTube channel. And there's no blood. There's no baby parts. We want you guys to understand what the real brutality of what an abortion is. If we don't recognize it for what it is, we're not, going to be, we're not going to be motivated and inspired to say, this is wrong. So you can go to the website, you can go to the YouTube channels, and you can actually see. And the machine that we use for all these videos, it's the exact same machine 
that was used to perform thousands of abortions. And you look at it, it's like, it's all rusty and ugly. And it is. We take it all around the country. I just had it up in Washington, D.C. We recorded for seven hours with it up in Washington, D.C. in a studio. And that rusty, ugly machine, that's the way it looked when I got it. It was already hooked up and ready for the next abortion. Just, a, I mean, that's the way this industry is. It's just vile. It's just the, we just closed down our last abortion clinic in Pensacola. Why? Because we had three moms that had such severe complications that the state said, you're shut down. One mom went in to get an abortion. Things went wrong because the guy didn't know what he was doing. She had to get sent over to Mobile, Alabama, got 30 units of blood, and they saved her life. Another mom in Pensacola, instead of just putting this up inside of the uterus, the guy pushed it on through, and it ruptured her uterus. She started to hemorrhage. Girl, first pregnancy, she had to have a hysterectomy. Her womb had to be removed to save her life. She'll never have another baby or get pregnant again. Third mom, Again, he did the same thing. He pushed that through the wall of the uterus, and not only did she start to hemorrhage, but then when he turned on the suction machine, it sucked her bowel into it. And so she had to have a segment of her bowel removed. Three women since January, just in Pensacola, that almost died and were brought to, two of them were brought to our hospital. One was sent over to Mobile, Alabama, and almost died because of having an abortion. So is this first, you know, they say, well, it's a safe medical procedure. Well. We've got how many patients walk into an abortion clinic? Two. You've got the mom and you've got the baby. You know, is this safe for the baby? No. It's definitely not safe for the baby, but it's not safe for the mom either. And even with the abortion pill, unfortunately, we're having moms that are dying after taking the abortion pill as well. How? The number one pregnancy-related cause of death in the first trimester, the beginning of a pregnancy, Still, in the United States, the first pregnancy-related cause of death is a ruptured tubal pregnancy. When somebody has a pregnancy test and they put four drops of urine and instead of one line it gets two, that says, hey, there's a pregnancy. It doesn't tell you where the pregnancy is. One out of a hundred pregnancies will be in the tube. So we've already found two cases where a young girl did a pregnancy test. She was pregnant. And the pregnancy test came back positive, but she wasn't ready for having a baby, and she was scared. So she ordered the abortion pill. She got the abortion pill, and they told her, you're going to take these pills, and you're going to have bleeding, cramping, and pain. What are the symptoms of somebody who has a pregnancy in their tube? Same thing. Bleeding, cramping, and pain. There was one girl who was pregnant. She ordered the abortion pill. She took it, and she had bleeding, cramping, and pain. But guess what? It was not just because of the pill. She had a pregnancy in her tube, and the abortion pill is not a treatment for a pregnancy in her tube. Her parents found her dead in their bedroom upstairs. They found her daughter dead, and of course, their first thought was, is this a drug overdose? How, what, why, why, is she, why is she dead? It wasn't until they did the autopsy, they did the postmortem that found out, listen, you don't know this, your daughter was pregnant, she took the abortion pill, but the pregnancy was in her tube, it ruptured, and your daughter bled to death. Um, we found two cases already. You know, they're not getting ultrasounds. They're getting this ordered mail order. So is an abortion dangerous to the baby? Yeah, the goal is to kill that baby. That patient, and you guys already saw how we treat these babies as patients on the inside, but we have moms that are dying too. But we weren't planning on doing that, but we'll answer any question. All right, we can move into <clears throat> some, some answers. Uh, how do you answer the argument abortion is okay in the case of rape, incest, or the life of the mother? Sure, well, when it comes to the life of the mother, there are, you know, there are, let's define that. Health. Anybody ever heard of uh, Roe versus Wade? Yeah, we've all heard of Roe versus Wade. Did you hear of Doe versus Bolton? Nobody? Okay. Doe versus Bolton was a decision released by the Supreme Court on the same day in 1973 where Roe versus Wade talked about health, but it didn't define the health of the mother. Doe versus Bolton, which was another decision that day, defined the health of the mother. And it defined health as physical, emotional, psychological, familial, or age. That's pretty broad. That means mom could be depressed, can have anxiety, might be too young, too old, or her mom or her dad don't want her to have the baby. So it was so broad. Are there conditions like an ectopic pregnancy where it will directly affect the life of the mother? Yeah. And our goal, there are even conditions where we need to deliver the baby, but that doesn't mean we kill the baby. 
An ectopic pregnancy is unique because, yes, that's a direct threat to the life of the mother, and if we had a way to move that pregnancy from the tube and put it into the uterus, we would, but we don't. So in those rare, rare, rare circumstances where a pregnancy might be a direct threat to the life of the mother, then we don't have any option. If we don't do something, we're going to lose mom and baby. So we do the best to try to save the life of at least the mom. And if there's anything we can do to preserve a baby's life, even if it means delivering the baby early, we'll do that. Now, when it comes to rape and incest, first, investigation. You got to investigate, get all the facts, and find out what actually happened. Rape, incest, whatever, are absolute horrible crimes. These are not crimes of passion. These are crimes of violence. And so we first investigate, and then we have a trial. And then if the person is found guilty, we punish them to the ultimate extent of the law. No doubt about it. The mom who is pregnant, we have to meet every need she has, whether it is not only her physical need, her emotional, her psychological, spiritual need. As a society, we do not kill a person because of the sins of the father. Yes, what the father did in the case of rape or incest is horrible and he needs to be prosecuted and tried and punished. But we don't, whenever you're think, getting a question regarding a baby in the womb, would we treat that baby the same way outside of the womb? If we are thinking that if it was rape or incest that conceived this baby, then it's okay to do an abortion at 10 weeks Okay, if you're going to use that logic, what if the baby's a year old? And then you find out that the father of this baby was a rapist. Would you then go to that baby and say, hey, um, we just found out your dad was a, a, a violent rapist. And we don't, uh, that's, that's bad. That's a crime. So we're going to, yeah, we need to take your life. No, we don't punish a child because the father was a sinner. You know, we meet the needs of the mom. But if we're going to be consistent that we're created in the image of God, Les and I travel all around the country. I can't tell you how many amazing men and women we get to meet whose father was a rapist. And the mom was counseled and was supported. And they're like, if my mom had not been told that I was a unique person from that moment of conception, and even though the, con the, the circumstances of my conception were bad and my biologic father is a sinner, I am so glad that my mom had enough love and support to let me come into this world. And these are some of the most outspoken people you will ever meet as far as defending life because they're like, my dad was a jerk. My dad was a horrible sinner, was a violent man. He raped my mom. But that doesn't mean that I don't have value. I was still created in the image of God. And that's the important thing we have to always think. <clears throat> What's the best thing you could say to a woman who's considering an abortion? It's a gift. You know, if you have the most amazing gift that you can ever receive, you don't reject that gift. You know, we really need to let them know that this is a gift, that they were created in the image of God. I have had dozens of patients who, years and years and years after an abortion, my, my wife used to work as a post-abortion counselor, and it's amazing you know, events that happened in the past. I've, ne I've had lots and lots and lots of patients who have said, you know, I had an abortion back in high school or I had an abortion back in college and I, I just can't shake it. I, I, it still is always in my mind. I knew when I was due, whenever, you know, I look back and I say, boy, I would have had that baby, that baby would have been eight years old. Then they go to a birthday party or somebody, they're at Chuck E. Cheese or something and there's somebody celebrating their eighth birthday. They can't help but think, my baby be that old now. You know, and it just tears them apart. So you let them know this is an amazing gift created in the image of God. And I've counseled dozens of people in my office. And I said, you know, I guarantee you, especially ones who have taken the abortion pill and then have regrets. I guarantee them when we come together eight months from now and we talk about how we were right here and you were thinking about aborting that baby and you decided against it, thank God. And then when they're holding that little baby, you can't help but think, Let's go back eight months ago. Remember when we were sitting in this room and you were actually contemplating taking the life of that baby in the womb? Can you look at that baby now? And they're all dressed up in their beautiful little clothes. Can you imagine what your life would be like without that baby? And you can guarantee them. I promise you, you will never regret continuing with this pregnancy and being blessed with this baby, but you will always have those regrets if you make that decision and you decide to take the life of that baby on the inside. And I've had patients, I had, let me tell you about one guy. I speak at men's conferences too. 
because this isn't a women's thing, because guess how, what percentage of pregnancies involve a guy? All of them, all right? But I was, uh, you know, speaking at a men's conference, and a guy came up to me afterwards, and he was probably a little older than I was, and he goes, you showed that picture of uh, the, your abortion clinic that when you took it over? I go, yeah, he goes, I've been there. He goes, I know those stairs. He says, I recognize that old gray carpet. He said, uh, back when my daughter was a senior in high school, she came to me and she says, Daddy, um, I need help. She goes, I'm pregnant. And he says, I didn't know about pregnancy centers. He said, I'd never heard a message about abortion and stuff from, from church. He goes, I go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday. He goes, I'm always there at church. He goes, I'm a saved guy. He says, but I didn't know what to do. He says, the only thing I knew is my daughter's pregnant, and she's scared, and I wanted to be a supportive dad to my daughter. So I asked my daughter, he said, he said, well, what do you do? She goes, Daddy, I'm graduating. I'm already accepted to the University of Alabama, roll tide, and I'm, I'm getting ready to go off to school. And I, I can't take a baby to school. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? She goes, I, I think I have to have an abortion. He goes, well, if that's what you think, he says, I'm going to be supportive of my daughter. He said, I drove my daughter to that office there on Bayou Boulevard. He said, she was only 17, so she was underage. He said, I had to sign the consent form. I had to put my name in ink there on that form, and I signed the consent form. He said, we didn't pay much with credit cards back then, he said, so I had to get out my checkbook. He said, I wrote a check, and I signed my name again. He said, I then saw my daughter get an ultrasound. He saw, I saw a black circle with a little flicker of something white on the inside. He goes, I knew that was my first grandchild. He said, I saw that heart beating, and then they took my daughter, and she went up those very stairs that you took a picture of. He says, my daughter went up those stairs, and uh, she was up there about 20, 30 minutes, and she came back down the stairs. Totally different girl. He said, not only has that affected her, he said, what I saw and what I paid for when I signed my name to was my first grandchild. He says, it wasn't just my first grandchild. He says, it's haunted me for decades. He says, I still don't have a grandchild. He talked about how, uh, sorry, he talked about how that was his only grandchild, and he said, I'm a saved guy. He says, I put my trust in Jesus. He said, but I never heard anything in youth group. I never heard anything from the pulpit of what abortion really was. He said that, uh, you know, he said, he described it, he says, that whole event in my decisions was like a lump of white charcoal that's been burning in my heart for decades. He said, even though I'm saved, I never went to God and said, God, I'm sorry, I, I screwed up. He said, I was supposed to be a dad and I was supposed to be a granddad, and I made a wrong decision. He said, and I never went to God and said, please forgive me. He said, why did I never hear that from my church? He said, it's just been burned my heart for decades. He said, why did I have to hear a gynecologist of all things? You know, uh, say that, is abortion wrong? Yeah. Is abortion a sin? Yeah. But is abortion such a bad sin that it can't be covered by the blood of Jesus? Is Jesus' blood not precious enough to cover the sin of abortion? He said, why did I never hear that? He says, I just quietly prayed to God and said, God, I screwed up. I'm sorry. He says, I already feel that the power of just being forgiven of that. So it affects men. I mean, lots of pregnancy centers now have men's ministries just because every pregnancy does involve a guy. And, a lot of, and what's one of the biggest factors as far as a woman making a decision for life is having her baby daddy there, even if they're not married, for the ultrasound. And they can see that life. Why do we listen to the heartbeat? Because you guys, you always have your earbuds. You have your iPods. You have your uh, beats by Dr. Dre on your head. You understand rhythm. It's one thing to see one line versus two line. But when you do an ultrasound, you see a flicker and you see something moving around the inside. But then you hear the thump, 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 thump. That's a life there on the inside. And so the ultrasound is an amazing tool. But it's a time to minister to the mom and minister to the dad and to train them both. And you know, with the pregnancy centers, when they're dealing with the men's ministry and helping them make good decisions, they're actually making, you know, 
Guys don't like to go in and see all the, the frilly Laura, Ashley, Vera Bradley type decorations and stuff and baby stuff. But they walk in and they see, wow, you know, there's some sports memorabilia. There's a football. There's a fishing rod. There's a man's man that's got a godly man who is there to help me make this decision and let me know how to be a dad to this child and how to take this responsibility but understand the blessing and the gift that a child is. So pregnancy centers are there for the women. They're there for the babies, but they're also there for the dads. So how does an abortion affect a girl mentally? It can be really tough, um, you know, because you realize what that gift of life is. I mean, for the ladies that are here that you've had a baby, I mean, you know when you're pregnant. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I have patients that will come in and say, you know, I know the test isn't positive, but I know my body and I know I'm pregnant. You know, and a week or two later, test is positive. You know, and babies are just an amazing gift. But that's when it comes down to forgiveness. You know, it is so important. I mean, it's a life that's there on the inside. You can feel it moving around. And uh, women, it can sometimes really affect them mentally for not just years, but for decades. Especially, I've had patients who you know, were scared, they were pregnant, they were young, they had an abortion. For whatever reason, they can't get pregnant. They try in vitro fertilization, they spend a fortune trying to get pregnant, and then they look back and it's like, I can't believe it, I was pregnant. Everything was going perfect and I took the life of that baby. And they think it's a punishment from God. It's like, no, don't look at this as a punishment from God. But when you have a baby and then you have a second baby, and you realize how amazing your life is. Then you think about what would my life have been, that baby, and I would have been the oldest baby. You know, so it can be tough mentally, emotionally, especially for the moms when they've had either no babies, but then when they experience the love. I mean, I couldn't imagine my life without my daughters. There's no way, you know, and so it's a gift. And, uh, you know, but that's when post-abortive counseling ladies are so important. I mean, you don't have ministries of post-abortive if there wasn't a need. And you say, well, that's outside of the church. You know, that's other people. We don't have these problems in the church. I just read a, a, a study, and it showed in evangelical churches that the men and the women, 18% of the men and the women in evangelical churches had somehow been personally involved in an abortion. In the Catholic church, the number was 24%. So when you have 18 to 24% of the people in your pews have personally been involved in an abortion and they're hurting like that grandfather who paid for his first grandchild, his only grandchild to be aborted. When you've got that number of people that are really dealing with something very traumatic and you're never discussing it from the pulpit, I mean, that's the role of the pastor, you know, and, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So if the pastor sees that need, but they're, they'd rather talk about their softball ministry, and I don't know if y'all have them, but, but they're talking about all these other things. It's like, look at the real obvious thing. You've got 20% of your congregation that is really dealing with something that has affected them for years and decades. We need to, number one, talk about abortion being wrong, like we're doing here in this church this morning, but then talk about for those who've been involved in it, you know what? It was a sin, and it was wrong, but it is a forgivable sin, and that is the message of the gospel. So number one role of the church, share the gospel. I mean, that is the good news, but of all the things that are going on, I really think that number two, as far as the ministry of the church, it's got to be related to the issue of life and abortion and helping those moms and dads after they've had an abortion. All right, one that's moving up quickly is, yep. I'm a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Yeah. I was coerced by the abortion industry. What do you say about girls who are too young to give birth, like a 10-year-old girl? Sure. All right. Let, first, let's talk about sexual abuse. You know, somebody says, well, I, I, wanted to, I made a decision. I wanted to maintain my sexual purity and my virginity, but I was sexually abused. You cannot have your purity taken away from you. This is only something that you give away. So if you were sexually abused, raped, assaulted, you did not make a bad decision. Whoever committed that crime should be investigated, prosecuted, and put away for as absolutely long as possible. But you did not make a decision. In the eyes of God, you have still maintained that sexual purity. As far as pressure, yeah, I mean, I've had 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds pregnant, you know, and in our residency, we've had them. But... Are they young? Yeah, but a good society will say, you know what, this wouldn't have been what we had planned, but this society, this church, we will meet the needs of this mom and we'll meet the needs of that baby. You know, if mom feels at age 11, 10, 12 that she cannot meet the needs of that baby, 
mom, first of all, probably needs some support as far as even being, having a foster parent. There are parents who have not only fostered the young girl who's pregnant, but then they have then co-fostered her child. You know, um, if she, the miracle of adoption, there are a million couples that are trying to adopt a baby. You know how much it costs to adopt a baby in the United States? Average, $60,000. What young couple that would be great parents and maybe can't get pregnant can afford to drop $60,000 even to finance that? We have a problem with it. It's a challenge to adopt a child. But we're not going to, you know, compromise. You know, when you think about what decision should I make, how should I live my life? Well, if you're really trying to figure out how should I live, if I've got a decision, what am I going to, my decision going to be? I look at Jesus. Look at the life of Jesus. Make, look at the decisions he made. There is no example where Jesus compromised to fulfill the will of the Father. So if we are saying, well, she's only 11 years old, because again, Les and I have met a lot of people who had real young moms, and they're like, I can't believe if my mom had aborted me, I wouldn't be able to be here. So we don't compromise and say, mom is young. We meet all the needs of the mom, whether it's physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. When she delivers the baby, we make sure that we have a family that is going to help her and support her. But we can't compromise and say, mom is young, we need to abort the baby, and somehow say that's the right thing to do. Still, created in the image of God at that moment of conception, we just need to be, do the role of the church to help her, to support her, to guide her and meet her needs. Let me say one thing, because a couple mm -hmm. questions around health care sure. and the pitfalls or the problems that we have in society around uh, foster care and the mistreatment of children. Yep. There's a couple questions kind of around that. The, the problems, the society <clears throat> problems we have in the realm of health care and in the realm of foster care <clears throat> should not be a reason for us to abort babies. Just because there's problems in one area of our society, like health care, doesn't mean that's a, a reason to abort a baby. I mean, health care definitely has its, issue, its issues. I mean, health care does not recognize the value of life. Um, you know, you can now do a fellowship, two years of training after 12 years of, of medical school and college and residency, and then you can spend two years on how to do late-term abortions, and the fellowship is called complex family planning. Health care has a lot of, you look up in Canada, Canada has a program called MADE, medical assistance in dying and you are not at the end of your life you've just been given a challenging diagnosis and you can actually schedule and invite family and friends where they will give you a an ivy cocktail and then you will die there with your family and friends this is not medicine this is not health care when it comes to people saying abortion is health care Abortion is not health care. That's taken the life of somebody, but that's not health care. When you had those 12 doctors and nurses and anesthesiologists fixing that baby with open heart surgery, that's an example of health care. We spend, you know, there's only a certain amount of money. We have so much waste here, you know, with our tax dollars. We could meet every need, pregnancy-wise, mom-wise, if we would not have resources going to be so wasted as they are. We have amazing resources, but we're not delegating them. Um, as far as physicians, physicians need to be involved in politics more. We have way too many lawyers that are representing and being senators. We don't have enough physicians. We don't have enough pastors. We don't have enough godly men who are taking time out of their lives to say, I want to you know, represent my, you know, my community, my school board. So we need to be involved. But there's plenty of money. It's just a matter that a lot of that money is being diverted to other resources, make, which make no sense whatsoever. So health care is a huge issue. Even as far as the bias, they will now, when we have, you know, in my residency, obstetrics and gynecology, when we have, uh, you know, residents, I mean, medical students who are applying for residency programs, advanced training obstetrics, they will now openly ask them, we have a resident-run abortion clinic. Would you have any res uh, reservations in working at our resident-run abortion clinic? They'll search your social media. And if you have posted, I'm pro-life, I'm the pro-life generation, guess what? You're probably not going to get into that residency program. The goal of the medical community is to weed out all of the pro-life OBGYNs so that in 10 or 20 years from now, there will be no, no pro-life OBGYNs. All the OBGYNs will be pro-abortion. There's an organization I'm a life member of called APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And there's 7,000 of us that are you know, members of this organization. And we stand up and say, 
we disagree with all these OBs who are performing abortions. And we are board certified and just as licensed and tr well trained as you are. But abortion is wrong. So it's not just Bill Lyle that's going around. There's 7,000 of us that are members of APLOG. So healthcare is not, purpose, you know, it's not perfect. Just like pastors are not perfect. You see the, you know, the, the Southern Baptist Convention and some of the stuff. There's evil and there's sin in any kind of business and industry, whether it's entertainment, arts, Hollywood, school teachers, school teachers having bad relationship with their kids. I mean, we live in a sinful world, and it's not just the physician. Sin is around us all over the place. But does that mean, well, it's all over the place. We're just not going to fight it? No. We have a duty and an obligation to do the best that we can to point out evil, point out sin, discuss forgiveness, but fight evil where we see it. Okay, two, three questions left, and we'll be done. Two of them are medical related, one that, that got bumped up very quickly. Uh, what about taking birth control specifically for periods? Sure. Um, when I have patients that are not sexually active, they're not married, and they've made the same commitments to sexual purity, and they're having real violent, sometimes really heavy, real painful periods. I don't refer to the, the hormones as a birth control pill. I mean, it's not birth control if they're not having sex. Birth control prevents conception. Well, not having sex is, you know, not going to get you pregnant. So I, when I start to have a young girl, maybe she's 14, 15 years old, she started having her cycles, and they are miserable. She is down and out for 10 days out of the month. I don't call it a birth control pill. I call it a cycle control pill. I mean, it's not birth control if she's not having sex. So if you go to your doctor and you've been having horrible cycles and you're not sexual active, it's like, don't say that I'm taking birth control. I'm, how can I be taking birth control? I've never had sex with anybody. I'm waiting until I get married. Well, it's not birth control. It's cycle control pill. And it's the same hormones, but we're using it to help control your cycle, not to uh, cause contraception. How does pornography affect the brain? Oh, my gosh. Pornography affects not only women and men and adults, it affects kids, and it is so available. I mean, it is on your smartphone, it's there on your hip, it's so available. It's, you know, when it comes to the hormones, you know, when it comes to the, you know, arousal, I mean, first, it is unobtainable. You can't have that kind of arousal in a normal, you know, healthy, you know, husband and wife relationship. It releases all sorts of hormones in your brain, which because it's overstimulated, you just can't match that with your normal relationship. Um, it makes absolute chemical changes in your brain when you're having that kind of stimulation and it alters you, whether you are young or whether you're older. And we see this so much more in our, in our field of obstetrics and gynecology with just women. This is not a guy thing anymore. It's not that guys are addicted to pornography. It's the women as well. And they are just doing everything to attack you at a young age to get you addicted. When you look at all these sex crimes, and you, you remember like, I'm Chris Hansen from Dateline NBC or something, and you see these older guys who are wanting to have sex with these young Younger kids, it's almost always because they got into pornography and they're looking for that next level, and their their brain just can't meet that need. So then they go to something even more horrible with these little kids. But yes, it'll affect your brain, and yes, it does affect a normal relationship, and it is horribly damaging to a married couple later in life. Yeah, I'll add to that because I've counseled hundreds of married couples, and I would say 90 to 95 percent. Of the couples, it, it goes back to they're having intimacy issues. It always yep. goes back to pornography. Oh yeah, always. All right, last question. I'm going to group these two, and they're kind of the whole purpose for why we're doing this. I'll read both questions. Uh, why do people refuse to accept that they are wrong about something that is right? And how do you approach people like transgender or pro-choice in an effective and productive way? Transgender and pro-choice. All right, let's talk about that. Um, God is the creator of all science. So science will always defend God's principles. When it comes to the baby in the womb, true science will defend the life of that baby in the womb. It doesn't matter if you go to genetics or whether you use ultrasound, whether you use fetal development. And there's, I saw one of the questions was about the word fetus. Fetus is just Latin for little one. I mean, it's not like it doesn't, it's not a person. So it's getting down to the science. Science will always defend the preborn. And what was the, uh, how do you be effective? Your generation is so visual. That's why 
We put up, so, I mean, I put up probably two or three videos a week. I'm, I'm starting my office on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, you know, popping up a video. You're such visual learners. If you're with a friend in school and it's like, hey, can I share this verse with you? If they're not, you know, go, a church-going person, what's their response going to be when somebody says, can I share this verse with you? Dude, you know, come on. If you say, dude, did you, did you see this video on TikTok? It's like, nah, everybody's sharing on TikTok. It's an effective tool. You know, that's why we're trying to give. We didn't want you guys to just come in and say, hey, I'm more pro-life than I ever was. We wanted, almost like, we wanted you to come in with a toolbox, and we wanted to put some more tools in that toolbox. We wanted to let you be able to say, do you know that you can actually have one baby in the NICU that has rights and protection, and another baby that's in the belly that's an identical twin? How does this twin not have rights, and this baby does have rights? Patients' rights, we talked about it in the very beginning. You know, are you an advocate for patients' rights? I mean, ask your friends, do patients have rights? Of course they're going to say, Psh. yeah, because especially after COVID, everybody understands what a patient is. And every, anybody here not ever been a patient? Never seen a doctor? Never, had, never gotten sick? No, we've all been patients. So we understand that patients are us and patients have rights. So you can ask your friends, you know, do patients have rights? Well, what if they weren't born in the United States? No, man, I don't care whether they, they still have rights. What if they weren't born in the United States yet? And it's really an effective tool. In fact, I talked about the guy from the University of Florida College of Medicine, smart guy. There in the back row, when he was bold enough to stand up, Dr. Lyle, here at the University of Florida College of Medicine, we've been taught that a patient is a person who is entitled to respect and bodily integrity. Same guy came up to me after the talk. We, we had a 45-minute talk. He came up afterwards and he goes, Dr. Lyle, he goes, i got to talk to you. He goes, i got a feeling you believe in God. I'm like, I'm glad that came across. You know? He says, I don't. He says, I'm an atheist. He says, but I will tell you. He says, I walked in here and it, regarding abortion, my mind was that it's a woman's right to choose at any gestational age for any reason. He says, but I'm in medical school. And he says, I'm a huge advocate for patients' rights and defending patients' rights. He says, I just had no idea how we were treating babies in the womb as patients to that extent. He says, if I'm going to be consistent, he says, that's a patient. I need to protect them. He says, I don't know exactly where I stand on all levels of abortion. And he says, but I really think you've convinced me that we can't be having abortions like this. He goes, you can't call me Dr. Pro-Life completely, but you've changed my mind. This is a guy who doesn't go to church. This is a guy who doesn't even believe in God. But when you appeal to what they do understand, patients' rights and science, he's like, you got me. So if you can have that kind of effect on somebody who doesn't believe in God, then I think this is an important direction that we can use to defend the preborn in the womb. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm kind of puttering out here. So. Let's, let's give him a hand tell him thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Lyle. All right, I'll, uh, I'll pray and close this out, but just a reminder, we do have some games going on. Uh, if you... Uh, if you feel so inclined, swing by the tables, grab some more cookies and drinks and stuff. But if you head out that hallway that's all the way down at the end of the building, you'll find your way out to the field. We have some of our young adults uh, doing a tic-tac-toe relay. Uh, we also have big ball volleyball. Um, so hang around if you want. Uh, just, just kind of free time. We have some other games out there as well. But thank you for coming today. Really appreciate it. Hope you learned something. I hope you're your mind was changed. And also, yes, if you have other questions that you didn't get to ask, you can email us at truth at tbcin.org um, and, and we'll get answers to those questions for you. Um, so feel free to take a snapshot of that after, after I pray. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for Dr. Lyle. I pray that you would just bless his work. Father, I pray for the, the teens that are here today. Lord, would would we take what we have learned and not just keep it for ourselves, but would we share it? Would we be convicted? Would we be uh, ever mindful of moving forward and, and looking for people uh, that we come across in our sphere of influence who, who have ungodly opinions, who have opinions that are counter to your word? And would we use, Lord, uh, what you've shown us today, this, this marrying of, of science and your word and how you are the God of all science, and we thank you and we praise you for that, and I pray that we would just be emboldened and strengthened as a result of today. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen.